Okay, everyone, this is the top of our, and this is Sam O. And with Javid, we are the core uh, conference chair. I'm the also exec director of Dublin Core. Welcome to this MI 2022 uh, virtual conference for three days and the course workshop following two more days. And uh, let me briefly explain, um, can talk about the DCMI principles and DCMI uh, terms always been a, a foundation standard. It's very simple to understand, well-documented. I think we are just, just enough. And it's getting more and more very useful for machine learning. And also the WCO Thompson community and really contribute to the graph metadata for interoperability. It's a combination of a standard and constraint for specific needs and it's very interoperable with the linked open data. It had double equal terms has a worldwide applica applicability and you know, translatable into any language and it will work over in a very low resource environment at learnable at all levels. And uh, and Dublin Core community has been an instrumental, I think, to advance of a meta 3.0 and has been and core members of a semantic web, link open data, knowledge graph, and Wikidata. And Dublin Core has been always frontier of using URI as a global identifier and persistent and consistent, and URI as a links and graph data structures and uh, machine understandable. And uh, we are very Power to report is uh, among the linked open vocabulary, 85% of them use uh, doubling core terms. And, uh, and the doubling core has been, and always been not just to those, uh, you know, the 15 elements that many people know, but it's been, you know, frontier of innovative practices, you know, bridging the you know, gap from the meta 2.0 and 3.0 as simple as practical solutions and a couple uh, across uh, many languages and appropriate for the low resource conditions. And uh, in a part of ecosystem of schema.org, we work very closely with them, Wikidata and B frames. And uh, it's uh, good for machine learning, automated indexing, and hopefully will be also helping move to a metadata profile now. And the DCMI is a very much global community, and we are finally supported by and three regional members, 10 institutional members. And I think, you know, organizing like this it really benefit to many, and we really need more members to join and to support us. And, uh, you know, briefly, we have uh, uh, you know, two best practice sessions and 10 presentations, and we have uh, like a DCMI community updates, six presentations, flash talks, four presentations, two keynotes, and the panel, eight panels, 31 presentations, and the, the papers, five sessions, and the 14 presentations, and student forum, four presentations, so one tutorial, one workshops. And uh, lastly, I want to really appreciate to all the organizing committee members. They worked uh, tirelessly, and I cannot thank them enough. They, and they, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Javid Mustafa, is our core conference chair, and uh, he's the um, professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and he's also director of a health informatics program, and, and the former editor in chief of our prestigious journal of H Assist. Javid, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. And let me see if I can. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure, my honor to be uh, associated with uh, this conference. And uh, we're so excited to uh, have you all join us. And uh, uh, we look forward to having a very successful and vigorous conference. Um, I'd like to make basically two quick points and then make an announcement, and then I will introduce our esteemed uh, keynote speaker today. May, uh, the two points that I would like to point to is that I have, uh, coming from the field of information and information science, I've always been, of course, very 
uh, much uh, uh, in the uh, metadata uh, sort of realm. My, I remember from my PhD, my advisor, Francis Mixa, was a big classificationist, and he always uh, imbued in me uh, a respect and a, uh, a, a basically a curiosity about how metadata originate and how it works and how we can take advantage of metadata to make information more accessible and usable. And DCMI, to me, has always represented uh, the, the major uh, professional society exclusively focused on metadata research and scholarship and practice. So uh, it gives me special pleasure to see the growth and the vigor of this organization. Um, I, I hope that it continues to grow geographically. Um, as, you, as you saw the map that Sam pointed to, there are areas that we could uh, expand. Uh, potentially, there are large areas in Asia we can grow, as well as in Africa. I think there are lots of opportunities to develop new links, new relationships. But even more substantively than that, DCMI can cross into other fields, other um, uh, domains, and especially all of us know that one of the domains where metadata is extremely important uh, and vigorously and uh, continuously developed and used is biomedical and health informatics area. We are obviously very familiar. I think many of us are familiar with subject headings and we know that National Library of Medicine's uh, medical subject headings is a major uh, resource. And so um, biomedical health informatics has always been a very important area for metadata scholarship and development. Another society that is important in the health and clinic, clinical metadata use is American Medical Informatics Association. So with that kind of a uh, aspiration to bridge into other disciplines, we have invited today's keynote speaker who represents the biomedical and health informatics uh, area and has been doing a lot of interesting projects and research. Uh, I will come to her introduction here very shortly. The, uh, the other area that I just mentioned that the reach uh, in terms of geographically is very important. Another way to expand the society is to think about other types of organization and institutions that we can connect with both for-profit and non-profit. And I hope that over time, we will develop stronger, much stronger ties with the professional organizations and societies. Now for the quick announcement. Um, so uh, in consultation with Sam and the executives uh, in uh, DCMI, there is now a plan underway to launch a journal on metadata advances and practices called MAP. And the goal is to develop it as a born digital, purely online uh, journal. And uh, it will be modeled after many of you, those of us uh, who have been involved in this area, in the information and science area. Remember a very popular journal called uh, Digital Library Magazine. It's kind of like ACM communication, but it was uh, published online. And, um, and we also are now familiar with PLOS. So the goal is based on some of my experience in the editorship for JSIS, is to help launch and develop this new journal. So stay tuned and uh, hopefully many of you can uh, engage and participate in creating this new forum for metadata advancement. Finally, uh, let me introduce our uh, keynote speaker today, Dr. Hong Feng Liu. Um, I don't know, you know how, my, how to introduce her because she's almost become an institution of her own. She has done so much for the field. I have a lot of things written here, but uh, I want to say that she's considered a, a key scholar, a key developer of new ideas, new directions for the field. She is a faculty member in uh, Mayo um, currently, but she is very involved with uh, 
research. She has been funded uh, since 2003 to, uh, through many grants uh, from NIH. She is also a very active member of several professional societies. I just mentioned one of them there, which is very important, the American Medical Informatics Association. And she has done significant research on uh, unlocking the, the key information in uh, electronic and clinical data and to accelerate uh, discovery and delivery of uh, new healthcare interventions. For her work, uh, very recently, the most important society, as far as I know, the American Medical Informatics Association in this field has recognized her with the Innovation Award. Um, so welcome, Dr. Hong Fang Liu. We are very glad to have you join us. Thank you. Screen, yeah, do you want to, yes. Share. Can you all see this? Yeah. Screen? Great. So first, thank you uh, for invite, inviting me here to um, have to give this uh, presentation. Actually, when I look at it, I was more thinking about I come here to seek help. Um, so I just give a little bit of background about me as well as uh, the environment I'm in and um, how, how me as a um, researcher started to see uh, it's no longer um, possible to do um, without um, reaching out and connecting and uh, to, to get a help from the information science community. So my general background of me, um, so I actually trained as a mathematician in my undergraduate and become uh, fascinating about information science through my PhD study. I later was uh, deal with um, a lot of things related to machine learning, predictive modeling, and uh, to manage the, um, use the ontology to manage, um, you know, biomedical information. But it's from 2011 until now, I'm actually in this field and living in the field and with some real world implementation, implementation kind of effort. But the more I get into it, the more I think I, I need the broader community help. So um, many of you probably don't know mail uh, because this has been a joke. Uh, there was a real mail there. And if you Google mail, this is uh, uh, about, uh, what do you will get? Uh, this is relevant to what I was going to talk about it because the mail as a term, as a token itself can represent in many different things and the different context. How do we, um, you know, disambiguate and uh, understand it actually require a lot of uh, wonderful work in the information science metadata. So Mayo actually, uh, you know, for those who <laughs> Google it, and this is the head, it's currently the number one hospital in the nation in the world. Um, it's a more team-based practice as an institution. Um, now go to the dramatic ones, which are uh, actually as a researcher scare me. Um, this is um, what we currently are going. Uh, this is, uh, um, uh, what economic submits um, our um, CEO, um, Gianrico Fruger, being a pioneer in thinking about technology, thinking about digital transformation. This is a snippet from the, that conversation. If you look at it, uh, this is the pieces which the healthcare uh, is going. This is about the future of the healthcare. It's more deal with data deal with artificial intelligence and a deal with how do we be able to leverage the data to um, derive a digital platform to bring healthcare at the center. So, so the difference is that it's no longer um, a you know, research topic area. It become more like a real world implementation practice. So, so I'm going to, 
you know, just to give some general background in the healthcare domain, how things are going, what the research we've been working on, what I would see um, the area we need dramatic help. Very brief introduction of the health IT standards. Uh, so many of you seek care, care you, you know that the data currently, the clinical data is more digitalized with all your vital information, your labs and your problem list, all those things that currently um, be digitalized, uh, stored. And um, due to that digitalization, the healthcare become more data-driven healthcare where the information being used for decision support of patient care, uh, information be used for trying to think about automated reporting and quality measures and about data sharing. And um, so interoperability become a key component in the healthcare domain. Um, where you know we this community, I don't need to talk about what what's how important interoperability is. Um, but in the healthcare domain itself, which is a human centric or people, you know, kind of uh, environment, a lot of the times um, it's no longer about, uh, you know, how system interoperable with each other. It's more about how the system deliver information to the patients and how to retrieve the right data and the right information at the right time to making for making the right decision in the care setting. So um, in the standards side, as, as I mentioned, uh, how to retrieve, how to um, um, deliver the information, how to understand it, it all depends on the standards. So I generally lump the syntactic uh, standards uh, as more structure uh, standardization and the semantics more from vocabulary terminology side to look at it. Those are the current standards uh, in the health IT side uh, deal with the syntactic and the semantic interoperability. <clears throat> so briefly talk about the health uh, language uh, seven fire. Uh, this is the latest standard. Um, this is actually relatively <clears throat> new if you truly think about it. Um, HL7 so far in the health IT domain being the standard uh, which everybody uh, uh, embrace and adopt for the uh, I, for the for their um, I, IT systems, and um, it's oriented to May 2012. Um, when the uh, semantic web technology, all the other technology, been around for a while, I remember my first um, you know. Journal article is about using the SGML, um, the markup language standards to representing, um, you know, the natural language processing uh, results. But uh, the file standards is uh, is more um, tentative currently with um, forty nine resources and um, with the um, you know. Um, no, currently it's 145 resources. So you see dramatically expanding and they have different levels. And uh, for those who are, want to know it as uh, just a Google HL7 fire, you will get a lot of detailed information about it. Um, and uh, the beauty you know, of the HL7 fire is the combination of a social approach of metadata Gen, you know, uh, standard generation with the actual practical implementation together. So it is uh, more practical together with more rigor uh, combined with the social evolution uh, approach to derive those standards. So um, the history is generally um, um, currently across all the uh, healthcare systems. Um, Digitally, the most frequent standards adopted is HL7 version two. This is still about 95% of the uh, different healthcare systems communication uh, is using HL7 uh, version two messaging standards. And uh, this is, was designed um, in 1980s uh, to facilitating interoperability across different um, uh, systems. 
This is a 1980 standards, later become version three, uh, which is more XML based. Um, and at the same time, they try to bridge uh, unstructured, which is text related representation for human interfacing um, together with the computer interfacing uh, using the CDA documents, which is a, a clinical document architecture standards. But the CDA has not been really uh, widely adopted due to the rigor required to uh, enter such information um, where each piece of information have both structured and unstructured representation information. And this is the latest on the fire um, resource side, how such information being um, bring there. And as you can see, they being uh, heavily um, you know, with a lot of different layers, um, you have standard data uh, to be put there with UIL for definition, with a human readable summary, as well as the resource identify identity and the metadata associate uh, to be all in one um, message. Um, the different resources can combine together. This is a kind of form. Uh, uh, kind of from the semantic web or graph side of form a, form a um, you know, relationship and a, a, net, a graph here to link all those information together. So this can be the one record. So, so this is about the history HIT standards is all about, you know, now it's all go to fire and uh, uh, with all those standard vocabulary, um, has been around for a while. So I'm going to talk about next thing, which is re related to, um, you know, things um, when people adopt different standards, uh, the key things which needed is more about normalization. And in the US, uh, we have a, a government agency was established in 2004 um, by healthit.gov, which is specifically deal with the interoperability standards. Um, the, this is called Office of National Coordinator in 2004, um, established this uh, group. Um, and in 2009, um, we in, in the last recession, we, we want to, um, the one of the biggest investment is to try to digital transform the healthcare with the many, uh, uh, kind of investment from the government to try to to uh, encourage the wider adoption of uh, um, electronic medical records, um, and uh, so I think um, in 2015 all those data become um, you know the EHR patient records become digitalized, and then the the when things are digitalized means that in order to to retrieve the right information, right data at the right time for making right the decision heavily depends on how we make all those systems talk to, to each other as well as making the data talking to the uh, human, uh, the, which is the healthcare providers. And I'm fortunate to involve, get into this data normalization uh, through the Tucson line um, high tech uh, act. Um, effort and being um, being uh, leading this group, uh, the data normalization team, I would just talk about um, how do we um, leveraging the data we gathered through uh, electronic house records for um, all kinds of work, decision-making, um, cohort study and uh, uh, evidence generation, real world evidence, uh, analysis surveillance, and the data standardization back then we adopt is the clinical element models by Stanhoff from um, Intermountain Healthcare back then. And we adopted the clinical element models for representing the EHR data from different data sources. And um, back then I was quite naive when I needed this um, coming from the computer science side with the uh, work of natural language processing, I feel like this is already quite a structured, I just needed to decide on, you know, what information model to adopt, what the target uh, value sets 
you want each block to have. So the, the information model one that's more like a syntactic, the target of value sets is more semantics, and then you get a tune in there, then you can transform the raw EHR data to normalize the EHR data. Um, and, uh, but the actual work is not that trivial. We found that the clinical element model itself was, was used, was generated for representing transactional uh, data capture. So basically before the data even be captured, you adopt the standards in the, in the, in the system, but the existing data does not generate using the standards. And you actually needed to create a normalization uh, pipeline to, uh, to normalize that. And also those existing stand, existing data does not have all the details needed for populating uh, clinical element models. So we end up needed to create a more generic type of uh, work stream and getting the data represented there. And we, we, we being, uh, you know, leveraging that to generate a normalization pipeline where we, um, you know, standardize both uh, structure data, uh, which transmit to us through a health, health language 7, CCD, CDA, all those different standard messaging uh, information, as well as clinical documents, leveraging some mapping and leveraging some big, uh, you know, the unstructured information management architecture released back then by IBM Watson team. And that the Yoima now is the Apache uh, pieces. And then we get all those uh, house information exchange engine. This is commerce connect interface engine. And then you'll, you, you'll be able to transform the data from the original house care system to a standardized data. And we, we did a um, you know, prototyping of this framework. It looks, uh, looks like um, on the, on the uh, experiment side, it look, looks like a working. Uh, but the challenge actually faced related to semantic side. Uh, we found syntactic mapping. Um, if the information there, this is a, um, kind of, you know, um, be able to handle relatively easy. But the value sets, which is associated with each allowable value, tends to be quite a challenge. This is just show you an example. We have one, uh, one data model, which is internal data model with the value sets about, this is about uh, um, um, race and the race component. This is our internal code. If you want to map it to a standard target uh, data model, here we show the example of a pick on that. You, just, you can see there are different granularity here and a different level of, uh, um, you know, and unreadable for humans and um, creating mapping between them is, is a kind of relatively quite challenging. And the challenge is that um, the, even it is, a, in, you know, not, you know, for expert may not be, you know, hard, but for machine, and to keep this operationalized is very, very challenging. Actually, how do we how do we store them? How do we catalog them? How do we um, you know do the mapping? And uh, how do we you know uh, enable them check the data quality of the mapping? And how do we manage those mapping and value sets to enable that to be accessed? And the, this is a healthcare domain, um, so the. The piece is that it's different from the open data science domain, where the internal value sets sometimes considered to be a business uh, confidential information, and you don't really be able to, um, you know, know the those decode those codes to create a mapping. The only way to handle it is to go back to the original um, systems and uh, you know get domain experts involved and try to create such a mapping. We 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 to to handle this we try uh, to get a, a tool called work um work value set workbench and using terminology standards to create to facilitate the mapping process. And I try to take a uh, user uh, centric, centered approach to do, to do this ETL process. So 
So this is uh, basically try to leveraging a terminology standards. Uh, this here is um, a clinical terminology service standards too, and the leveraging that for um, uh, data normalization uh, pipeline terminology service. Uh, we also need to, as I mentioned, that data normalization require also mapping the clinical natural language processing um, you know, uh, results from uh, unstructured data also into some standards to facilitating semantic interoperability between um, structured data and unstructured data. So we're also creating this called common type system for clinical natural language processing where the uh, the system itself adopting standards to assemble pipeline with the uh, with the semantic representation of the NLP system to be followed the standard. Um, but then, but the, the the challenge after we finish doing this, it looks fine when you run as the research projects, but when you truly put into real world use, it does not really work very well. Um, first is the problem of data normalization. Um, we, we notice the issue of pre-binding, basically binding the value sets, binding the uh, syntactic mapping all those information before the, uh, you know, um, use before the application. I mean, those pre-processed data sometimes does not fulfill the real world use case, such as, you know, they may have different different um, granularity of the semantics. And uh, also, we also notice um, clinical data also by the care team and uh, normalization of semantics uh, actually sometimes um, have information loss during that process. Um, so this is the, the framework we propose as a um, general framework after all those uh, data normalization practice. We are encouraged the field to go into uh, late binding normalization, where they separate the uh, metadata management uh, from the uh, actual coding itself and leveraging the big data um, you know, technology stack to facilitate in real time um, uh, data normalization. We think this is uh, a way to handle because generally we are for any kind of application, we deal with um, different intelligence. Uh, sometimes it's a user wants certain things, then sometimes experts, you know, they want something, sometimes the data itself have things not representing in standards. And uh, so we, we this is a, a more real world scenario. How do we deal with this um, big mess of uh, data to normalize, standardize them for a real world application? And uh, this is uh, uh, currently, we actually implement this as a, as a, um, a real world system. Uh, so this is uh, showing you uh, uh, a translation effort. We translate what we show previous slides to actually a workable system, real world system uh, is the enterprise infrastructure uh, to facilitating a retrieval and delivery of information at a point of care uh, using a, you know, this data normalization framework uh, using big data computing and uh, using a unified data representation, uh, unified data platform. To, to enable this uh, different application on top of it. So next I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, clinical natural language processing because that's um, kind of something uh, which are, I did my PhD thesis on, and this has been my, uh, you know, uh, work because the language to many people probably, um, you know, it's just a language, but to me it's uh, something actually is the, uh, the key function uh, of um, keeping our um, society moving forward. And we, no matter how hard we try to adopt standards, we always have this issue, uh, how to balance uh, between structured data entry, how do we, um, you know, you know, 
make the human part, the interoperability between machine and human always goes through the language part. This is uh, um, um, from the 2013, after all the EHR being widely adopted, um, there were encouragement of uh, you know, data to be captured structurally following some standards, but we always have this dilemma of the free text component where the information tends to be human friendly when you use text to represent it. Um, so it's not a surprise because the pro primary purpose of a clinical documentation is to facilitate in the communication among the care team for decision-making. And most of the time, um, the, it's information reach uh, in the traditional clinical documentation. And this is a snippet from uh, one of the article is that uh, when people using EHR, um, they are complaining about it. Say in the old days, I always read the nurse notes. There was three to 10 pages. Um, now I give me a quick overview, how the patient's doing. Now the hospital EHR folks on, you know, regulations, lawyers have many pages of checkbox, no good way communicating. Um, we know the, so, so basically for human, to facilitate interoperability between system and the human, the, the, the language of the free tax is still the most efficient way and the descriptive way and the flexible way to communicate. And so, so, so you are debug, you know, you are battling with the pages of checkboxes where the data can be captured structurally, computer friendly for machine learning and for all the other analytics tasks, but you also have things like a family history of vehicles, clone cancer, diabetes as one single sentence, which captures the information needed from those dozens page. So this is the dilemma between data, the raw data and the information. So um, this is, an, you know, for, for us, uh, natural language processing itself representing on the left the diagram which is how do we transform the free text to more structured representation. So all the different, um, you know, downstreaming computer applications can leverage that. And um, we think up to now, given the special characteristic of EHR text, we think we actually can do pretty good up to semantic processing because the language itself tend to be closed domain language because you know you want the care teams to be able to communicate in each other. You also want the different healthcare systems to be able to receive the uh, notes or receive the uh, data, be able to understand those. So, so those are, are relatively straightforward. Um, but I come to the, the programmatic, this is the major challenge we are actually facing. This is the challenge I actually really need people to help us how to handle that. It's related to the context. Um, because for natural language processing, um, programmatic semantics or so context, uh, contextual natural language processing and with a structure representation, this has not been solved. It's due to the fact that the context is uh, it's, it's about when, how, and uh, why, all those different uh, metadata components there about the context are not there when, when the system receives a document. And of course, in the general um, informatics community, we, we mix all those different pieces together. So you will see, um, you know, generally uh, people talk about natural language processing, people talk about information extraction, concept extraction, information retrieval, uh, all those pieces of information. Um, there, there are more mixed, so you will see some convergence uh, right now. And this is actually reflecting us in the clinical domain, when we deal with uh, technology, we, we lump all those things together, so consider they are on one. Um, this is also something I think about, it depends on the granularity of the you know, language. Um, if, you, if you tell uh, 
your clinician partners to say information extraction is different from natural language processing or different from concept extraction, this can be very hard to convey. Um, we, we attempt uh, to um, handle this um, um, using clinical natural language processing, using the latest technology stack to do uh, standardization. This is showing you um, a work we, we did uh, two years ago. Um, it's a PhD thesis where we try to uh, transform a narrative, severe active leg pain with muscle weakness into a file, fire condition representation. If you transform this correctly and you'll be able to use this structured kind of representation move down uh, to handle many uh, different uh, downstream application use cases. And uh, from the natural language processing side, you can see all the coding, all the codes we adopt and what's the technology and the resource we adopt. And uh, so there are many steps um, here, uh, but uh, for those, not familiar, if you're not familiar, I mean, this is C, C plus seven digits. That's um, uh, a concept ID from Unified Medical Language System released by a National Life Medicine. Uh, you can see many uh, relationship types. So the in the in the clinical natural language process, we heavily depends on the um, the metadata, the ontology, the terminology, uh, as well as relation resources uh, available uh, from the um, natural life medicine, uh, their uh, a library branch related to um, um, terminology and the standards. And that the previous case showed the show the uh, a general use case of um, you know how we can process represent narratives into standards through some uh, natural language processing. This is an example showing you for a specific use cases, a lot of the times they simply just want a specific data elements to be extracted. Um, and uh, this we generally form as information extraction technology, where in this specific example showing you how we want to detect a silent stroke condition from radiology reports. Um, why we need natural language processing here? Because a silent brain infarction itself was not a, uh, does not have an ICD-10 codes representing it. Uh, and uh, so using structured data to like, uh, the code system or the standards to retrieve such a patients is not a possible. The only way to handle it is through uh, structure, through this um, information extraction type of framework. And uh, so now come to the tricky part. Um, so uh, the tricky part is that this whole thing, what to extract, it depends on the target use cases. In this specific use case, the, the researchers or the uh, want to have this patient's cohort to be identified called silent brain infarction cohort. Um, and uh, they couldn't get it. And uh, we as a, a real you know, kind of information, informatician practitioners, be able to get such information uh, from the text for them. I mean, is this high science? It's probably not, but it's a translation um, of um, a technology to enable uh, clinical researchers to be able to get the data to answer their clinical questions. And this is actually very, um, very simple task with a lot of uh, good performance and the clinical researchers be able to use this to do many wonderful things. Um, and um, we did that successfully. And this is this is an article uh, summarized on what are the clinical information extraction application in the domain. Um, and we did the literature review. We also checked the methods on how people are using it. And um, most of the technology people adopt, 
unfortunately or fortunately, all you know, on the right, on the leftmost, you will see what are the methods that people have been using. They're actually using a rule-based or knowledge-based approach. Um, then you have some use hybrid and the deep learning related the latest technology, they're not widely used. Um, if you are a researcher, you will wonder why. Um, later, actually, we figure out um, the primary reason is due to um, the uh, people centricity around uh, deal with the information and the rules to domain experts, they are much easier to manipulate, to handle, while the machine learning side uh, is difficult for them to comprehend. And uh, um, we also dig deeper into it. And we, we found out that even we talk about, we use uh, artificial intelligence or natural language processing techniques um, to build this, it's not really simple. They actually simply, you know, uh, to, to more, more many people, to especially to our clinical researchers, will end up with say, give, I give you data, you're using that magic, that network, transform to a structured representation. This is the, actually the dirty laundry of the list of things. Uh, we need to make sure we know what we are talking about. Uh, we need to make sure, you know, are we get capture the semantics of the clinician, what do they want? Are we make sure that we do this correctly? We needed to make sure, uh, you know, the algorithm to be evaluated with the performance to be um, developed. So there are many process, you know, many steps in order to get into the results. And we know there are many, um, many for clinical research, there are many um, use cases of using natural language processing uh, for different purposes. Um, um, unfortunately, we also noticed that even this um, uh, a quite active um, scientific community working on clinical natural language processing, the translation of the clinical natural language processing to enable real world observational studies actually is not that many. Um, we did a, a, this is a survey we done um, recently. Um, so from 10, 2009 to 2021, 20, sorry for the typo, we retrieved about 50 articles at the end, which actually using uh, natural language processing techniques for their study. And we check how, what area they've been focused on a lot in the mental health behavior side. Uh, but, uh, you know, you see some study um, about 66% of about the retrospective cohort study. You see some about cross-sectional study and the case control study. Majority of them, 82% of them simply just extracting a disease uh, from that. So it's, it's most of them are simple tasks. Um, but let's let's look at the trend. <laughs> so we we notice um, a lot of them. Um, you know, you have demonstration study leveraging rule based approach. You have measurement study using rule based approach. This figure just showing you um, the distribution information among those articles we reviewed, and uh, overall the unstructured data in EHR, we know there are a big chunk of uh, EHR information, but when you look at in the in the picture B here, figure B here, you notice um, we see dramatic in, uh, in increase of articles using EHR for observational research, which reached to 2700 um, in, in 2021. But you only notice about 58 of them are using uh, unstructured data. There is, I mean, some upward trend, but you will see there's a gap. And now go to the, the piece, which I really think uh, we needed to work on. We noticed uh, many of those studies, they say they're using uh, EHR data, they're using LP techniques, they actually don't report um, how the model is developed, defined, how it seems to be normalized, um, what a what's the context it is uh, using. So the, 
the this call this this part is that you see more than half of them don't really follow how we were thinking if you reporting a use of a technology uh, using the techniques um, you are the next to tell us <laughs> what exactly are you doing the NLP? <laughs> um, what the target you normalize to and and what kind of context you are using the technology so it's a very very poor uh, um, use. You may wonder, you know, why? Because remember, this is the most of those are our clinical um, researchers. Um, they, when they use technology, um, they think the technology is to just push a button. Um, then, then the, the things that we think an and concern is related to, if you don't report this, how can we really trust the research on it. So if you lack of reporting of the metadata of RLP in clinical research, um, what is the performance or what are the different things around it? We, we cannot safely use it because the data elements extract and most of them relate to disease and outcomes. They have a significant impact of the evidence generated and um, those has the potential to be translated to take care of the patients. Um, so there's a high stack on doing this correct. Um, but our general community here are, you know, as I emphasize, they don't really have that piece of training there. So research reproducibility is a significant issue we, we discovered. Um, and um, it's really a foundation for trust science and discovery, but the, the, we need a help. Um, there's a reproducible crisis there. And there are many kind of uh, uh, pieces around it um, besides the standardization uh, needed. And we also don't have a lot of information lost during the process. Um, you know, how do we get the information quality out of those real world data to facilitating, you know, uh, real world evidence generation? How do we ensure reproducibility require us actually to have an open science um, related mindset? You cannot have this as a black box. Um, you needed to have the process transparent and then you needed to ensure um, relative quality in the data. Uh, assurance uh, with necessary metadata. So on the natural language processing side, we keep emphasize um, telling people we cannot, we cannot give you a, a, a one single solution. What we can provide to people is the methods to need to factor in contextual factors, can uh, factor in data quality factors or human factors whenever you think about real world um, implementation of the solutions. Uh, many things to talk about, but I will, you know, um, skip uh, this. All those um, we have articles about it. Uh, this is a deal with uh, how do we capture necessary metadata regarding the task formula definition? How do we capture the corpus and the, the AI algorithm behind it? Uh, how do we, um, you know, ensure the model to be developed in a transparent way? And uh, how do we ensure the validity of the data uh, with, you know, through the evaluation? So many recommendations. We try hard to influence the community to do it correctly in, in at least, uh, ad, adopting the latest um, advan you know, advancement in the open science domain. Um, just to keep in mind, this in this environment, we don't really have openness, as you can see in the uh, in other scientific domain, due to the sensitivity of the data. So we we need help. Help is what this is what people is imagining from the news, from the pieces. They think there's a significant digital transformation in healthcare bring a significant benefits including many things that can be automated uh, with all the right purpose, right? Enhance the patient engagement, efficient healthcare analytics, improve care to patients. This is all good things. Um, 
But when we take the hu human centricity into mind, it's, it's not that nice. Because when we design system, we don't really think about human, the information consumers, the, the, the physicians, the practice, you know, healthcare providers, they are dealing with the uh, data connection and information summarization and make a decision. But what we are not be able to um, do a good job is that we, we, we didn't think the other side is a human. <laughs> um, so we could create a significant uh, stress and a burnout. That's the problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, most of the time, digital transformation of healthcare generates a lot of raw data with no specific meaning. And uh, historically, those were represented, captured as information in clinical notes where the physician um, put the you know, judgment there. How do we leverage technology to transform, to get the data into the information? And uh, the healthcare domain was assuming AI come to rescue them, to, to those technology will be able to handle that. And this is just showing you how, how, uh, how the situation is. Um, I was a researcher, right? So I tried to organize some scientific gatherings. This is the scientific gathering, which we expect about 70 people, but it become about 400 people attending. All those are healthcare providers and IT colleagues. And our CEO even attended that meeting to give an open keynote. Um, they, they are, they face those, uh, you know, humongous of data there. They want to use the data to do uh, a lot of things which data can bring. Um, and this is uh, the reality. Um, and in uh, most academic medical center, you will notice this, um, all those things. So we got the data, we needed to leverage the data to be able to do precision medicine. So since we got a lot of data, we have to use that data to, to, to deliver better care. The second and learning health care system, how do we be able to use the data to you know, optimize our health care system? And thirdly, now we have the digital technology, can we get more data and uh, use that to uh, help us to take care of patients? The reality is that a majority of the time, uh, we, we are not really have a tremendous expertise in those areas uh, where many of them do not really come to healthcare systems. So this is um, involve health IT, uh, data science and informatics, and uh, to our uh, you know, leaders, um, generally those three are the same to them. And uh, we, we have significant <laughs> gap there. Um, and uh, the piece is that this is the, what's the meaningful use, which is called JSON report, which try to say, if you want truly to leverage uh, the digital transformation, you actually need many kind of things where the data need to be uh, you know, indexed with metadata, need to be able to search, need to have ability to have uh, translation and have UI apps on top of it. And uh, we're going through this um, learning healthcare system, which we want to use such a data to transform, to uh, generate evidence. Uh, then we have a lot of meanings. Almost every patient now have a longitudinal patient records with the digitalized, be able to retrieve um, through the technology um, syntactically. And we want to leverage that to, um, to bring automation into the picture. Um, I bring this one uh, due to the fact there are two things which is critical, which is not highlighted enough uh, in all the conversations. It's one is the context, second one is understanding. Um, people talk about from data to information, to knowledge, to wisdom. There's the information knowledge layer but the, the current buzzword AI was to think about through data, direct wisdom, 
you know, not really um, taking the context and understanding pieces there. The context it, it itself and the understanding itself, that's a human part, uh, which actually require dramatic, uh, traumatic people centricity uh, consideration into that in order to move this forward. And to, to, to bring this attention to the uh, general medical community, uh, we did this um, uh, National Arctic of Medicine have this uh, publication, um, being fortunate to be part of it, uh, to help you know, try to get um, general and you know, in instruction or what AI can do, what AI cannot do and all those things to the medical community. And the, the tricky part is also come to a lot of things. Most of the time, digital transformative healthcare generate a lot of data, but the data is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you have a lot of things underlying of that data, which are not e explicitly captured. Um, there's a hidden pipeline line challenges. This is a significant ethical concern in the domain. And we have also significant interoperability challenges due to the fact that data are not shared across different healthcare systems. And we have significant data fragmentation. Uh, at the NIST in US, we are hoping through the um, 21st um, Care Act will help us to reduce the data fragmentation challenge so, so we can get a more comprehensive information for making decision. And uh, I keep emphasize because there are so many implicit context information are not uh, explicitly captured and um, we, we cannot truly use black box solutions. Um, and we also needed to think about how do we make all the AI developments, all those uh, core technology to be transparent. Um, and uh, this is emphasized, um, it's so critical currently in the healthcare domain to really um, think about uh, methodology side, the team science side, to bring information science, computer science, data scientists into the conversation uh, to help um, doing this correct. And um, go back to highlight the context, so the context itself is not a well captured um, and explicitly documented. And this is maybe you can consider as metadata, but it's, it's the representation of context, um, which is generally the, the whole environment, right? It's, it's not really, um, you know, most data assets does not have that. We human being uh, take the context situated that to do decision-making, but don't expect artificial intelligence algorithm be able to do that. And I think that's said, uh, this is all the lab members and uh, I will take questions.